Nationalism has been and continues to be a driving force in Europe. Nationalism is a word that gets thrown around a lot, but it's essentially identifying with a nation and seeking that nation's best interest. Another huge part of this is having a similar culture and language with the other people in the nation. One example of nationalism and its effects today can be seen in Catalonia, which is a region in northeast Spain. In Catalonia, the people speak Catalan rather than Spanish. Because of this, they have their own distinct culture that they feel um, entitles them to their own form of government as well. So their culture has driven a lot of independence movements that have been, quite recently as in 2017, suppressed by the Spanish government. Now the difference between political and cultural nationalism, they do go hand in hand, but the difference is important to note. Political nationalism is essentially political autonomy. It's wanting your own people to have a sovereign state to govern over you. Whereas cultural nationalism is the ideas and beliefs that build a culture, such as food and language and traditions that kind of set one culture apart from another. Our point today is that from 1350 to 1950, modern European civilization was defined by the increase of political and cultural nationalism through war, revolt, and revolution. The start of political nationalism dates back to the Hundred Years' War. Now, the Hundred Years' War was essentially a debate over the French and English line of succession. There was intermarriage between the two ruling families, and nobody knew who was supposed to rule what country next. In this time, we also start to see religion used to increase nationalism, as Joan of Arc famously claimed, God is a Frenchman. And when she said this, she was implying that the French were better than the English, therefore they could not lose because they had God on their side. Once the war was over after the Hundred Year Period, the lines of succession and the monarchies were established in both countries, we really start to see this increased national unity. Each, uh, each country had their own culture, they spoke their own language, they had their own traditions, and once they had these established governments to rally behind, they were really able to kind of build up that culture and build up that national desire, that national pride that previously had not really existed, which is the start of political nationalism in Europe. Now, an early example of cultural nationalism in Europe is Machiavelli's The Prince. The Prince was not written in Latin, as most things were at the time for the educated people. Rather, it was written in the vernacular. Because of this, only a few people in a certain area of Italy were able to read it. This really increased their sense of cultural pride and cultural unity, and really built, built them up as their own separate entity rather than just another part of Europe. This is also a sense of political nationalism because Machiavelli called for the unification of Italy, which previously had not been done. All right. So uh, while the prince was very valuable for its use of Italian vernacular uh, and for its emphasis on Italian unification, it was also uh, a very important uh, piece of literature because of its use of secular and uh, pragmatic politics. Uh, and we see this start to be applied to European affairs uh, in the 17th century crisis, or the Thirty Years' War, as it's uh, better known. Um, but the Thirty Years' War didn't necessarily start that way. It began as a religious conflict. Uh, after uh, Luther's uh, uh, Protestant Reformation uh, shook Europe, there was a lot of a lot of tensions between areas and people deciding uh, which religion would be dominant in what area. Um, the Habsburgs, who controlled uh, large swaths of land across Europe, uh, became very concerned about this. They themselves were uh, very Catholic and sought to predominantly establish Catholicism in all of their lands. Um, there was an issue with the line of succession in the Holy Roman Empire where there was competing Protestant and uh, Catholics vying for power at the throne. And we see war break out across Europe on religious lines. Uh, it begins a, a widespread religious war that goes on for, as the name implies, 30 years. Uh, as the war continues, it uh, proceeds to get just bloodier and bloodier. Uh, countries start to run out of money. And as they, they, they did start along, uh, you know, Calvinist, Lutheran, and Catholic lines, 
as fighting, but it became more of an issue of a balance of power across Europe. So we start to see things like uh, France and Sweden allying against the Holy Roman Empire to check its power, which along religious lines makes little to no sense because Sweden is uh, Protestant and France is Catholic. And so those alliances simply don't make sense along religious lines anymore. Eventually, we reach the conclusion of this, which is the Treaty of Westphalia, uh, where religiously not a whole lot is achieved. Initially, the war you know, was started in order to, uh, to have some sort of religious dominance, but the result is completely different. We do see uh, some treaty conclusions that have very long-lasting lasting effects, though. Uh, the development of new independent states, for example, uh, due to nationalist movements within those countries, such as uh, Switzerland and the Netherlands, uh, are one of the results of this. It also is the beginning of secularized politics in Europe. Religion doesn't, uh, after this point, really hold much weight when it comes to why people fight their wars. And we can see this because the Pope is completely cut out of the negotiating table. We don't see him, he's not involved at all. Um, after this point, we also see the development of uh, new government types, such as the British parliamentary system and uh, French absolutism, which are a very good example of their own individual cultures, like you might see at the Palace of Versailles. So nationalism in France has been around for a long time, as McKelly stated, goes back to Joan of Arc implying that God was a Frenchman. We also see nationalism being very prevalent during the French Revolution. The painting that you see on the screen, Napoleon Crossing the Alps by Jacques Le David, is a depiction of political nationalism within France during the French Revolution and beyond. Nationalistic views and feelings with France were high and would eventually spill over to the rest of Europe. Um, Napoleon national, okay, hold on. Napoleon used French nationalism to justify French expansionism. Uh, throughout Europe, only to find that French nationalism would turn against them in the other European nations. So Napoleon's aggression increased the nationalistic impulses of his enemies and those he conquered outside of France. There was a united hatred um, against Napoleon from European nations that came in the form of nationalism. And outside of France, we see in Goya's 3rd of May, of course, there's nothing that inspires nationalism like having foreign troops on your land. And that's depicted here, where the French are killing innocent Spaniards. Um, this sparks a sense of nationalism in Spain and unites them against a common enemy. And we see more examples of nationalism in other countries with the idea that they need to protect themselves from enemies outside of the country. One of the main places that we also see this is within Germany. This is the point at which we get to the culmination of European nationalism. And there is no better example of a European nationalist than the man himself, Otto von Bismarck. Uh, Otto von Bismarck was the dominant political figure in uh, late 19th century Europe. And he got there uh, by uniting the German people uh, via mostly military means. Um, and he did so without the use of the ideas of liberty for the most part. He was an old fashioned conservative and an aristocrat and didn't want to give uh, liberals any ground he didn't have to. Um, he was able to do this uh, by building up military strength within Germany and ignoring Parliament to do so, and was able to bait France into a war, which he was able to defeat them very, very quickly, and was able to write the German constitution within their palace of Versailles, which is just uh, an impressive show of you know military and national strength. And so we see liberalism dropped in, in Germany, and sooner enough, pretty much across Europe, uh, in favor of this, this visceral populism. And so um, the, uh, the liberals in Germany who had previously been rallying behind ideas of freedom and whatnot really didn't 
care at this point because Germany was powerful and independent. And we see uh, in this quote from Bismarck, uh, God has placed us where we were prevented, thanks to our neighbors, from growing lazy and dull. He has placed by our side the most warlike and restless of all nations, the French, and he has permitted warlike inclinations to grow in Russia, where formerly they existed to a lesser degree. We can see Bismarck using, uh, you know, fear inciting rhetoric in order to build this sense of militaristic nationalism against the other, those people being, you know, non-Germans outside of the country. Which leads us to the world wars, where we can see these clashing nationalist tensions between countries break, and uh, if you look at this poster, for example, that's a very, very clear sign of uh, British nationalism uh, with clear military themes. Um, and so in the world, world Wars One and Two, uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the ways they were able to keep the wars popular was by uh, enforcing these ideas of nationalism and attacking people who were just not theirs ethnically and linguistically different. Uh, so nationalism isn't shown just by people, militarization, paintings, and politics. It can also be shown through architecture. This picture is a St. Petersburg church in Russia. Um, is, is where is This is the spot where Emperor Alexander II was killed in 1881, and construction began in 1883. It would later be called the Church of the Savior on Spilled Blood. And this shows political nationalism. I mean, it differs very much from the surrounding neoclassical buildings. There are 81,805 square feet of murals, one of the largest in Europe, and those help depict the political nationalism that they had for Alexander and the pride that they had for him. But another man beside Bismarck that was very nationalist was Joseph Stalin. And Joseph Stalin had a big spirit for Russian nationalism and often chose this over communism. Uh, he used nationalism, or World War II for nationalism to help protect the motherland against foreign influences and create a buffer zone. Uh, Stalin in speeches often called the Soviet people the Russian people when in fact <clears throat> when in fact he was the leader of the Soviet Union, not just Russia. But Stalin claimed that Peter I and Catherine II were sinners because they allowed those foreign influences to come into Russia and affect their country. And he claimed that Ivan the Terrible was one of the best SARS that there were because he never allowed those foreign influences to happen. And he claimed that after Ivan's reign, that Russia fell apart because they kept letting things like Germanization into the nation and ruining their aspects of life. And it got so bad with his nationalism that at one point, he denied a trade for his son and a German official because his son was being held as a prisoner of war in Germany, but he didn't want his son because he was afraid that his son had been Germanized and he didn't want that foreign influence coming into his nation. So he denied his own son. Something that shows the lasting effects of nationalism throughout Europe that we still see today is the development of national anthems. So here on the timeline, you can see how we have the five major European countries we focused on up here. And the first one was developed in 1745. You can see as the timeline goes on and the rise of nationalism was going on in Europe, so we had the development of national anthems right in sync with that. So then, basically, we have national anthems all over today. Every nation you think of has a national anthem, and that's a direct result of the nationalism we see throughout Europe during this time period. And uh, so the driving force of nationalism in Europe was war, revolt, and revolution. And Europe was filled with these conflicts, which pushed the rise of nationalism from 1350 to 1950. So, at this time, we will open it up to anybody who has questions. Um, so, kind of a 
before the closing, it seemed like y'all had a lot of examples of really cool and interesting match conversions. So I would assume the goal is for you to use your memory of what you expect to really see the players. Was that kind of, was the error just going to play and kind of use like a setup to show there is an increase in match conversions, but it doesn't really affect anything? Or was it supposed to affect stuff that you were doing for the show? I think, uh, yeah, before Napoleon, those, uh, you know, sentiments and feelings of nationalism among just like the masses, generally speaking, it definitely wasn't as strong and had a lesser effect. And so you'll see it in some big works like we, like we pointed out, but it doesn't have the same, the same effect across the board that we see later in the World Wars. And so, yeah. So uh, I'm just curious, what do you guys have to say about like the European Union and how it developed as more of a state of itself, uh, uniting all of the European powers themselves and basically allowing for open borders, open transportation, and open trade within the countries, including among each country? I think the European Union came more out of, as we said, World War One and World War Two were like the culmination of everybody was super nationalistic, so everybody just fought with each other. And I think that they realized how horribly that affected everything. And it was an attempt to rally people, an attempt to, like, whether it was good or bad, they wanted to put Europe, Europeans kind of on a more similar plane to prevent such a thing for pro nationalism from taking over the country again. I would also add it doesn't that the EU doesn't necessarily fall in the time span of recovering and it deals a lot more with the Cold War where worries were less about nationalism, they're more honestly like about nuclear war and superpowers. But now that that is over, we are seeing a lot of separatist movements. As we pointed out at the beginning, we're seeing the UK separate in favor of this nationalism. And so I think things are starting to get a little shaky on that end. Other questions? In the recent years following World War II, so just the two years from you know, time going from 1914, besides the Soviet Union, was there a lot of nationalist agenda things within these other European countries, or was that really just kind of non European thing? I think that with like Germany, like obviously they were against, you know, they had the separation, but the people, the civilians, they wanted that nation to be together. And I feel like that's kind of a big part. Like later on into like not part of a presentation, but like in the nineties, like Pulaski. Well, I think that nationalism was still there within the community of the people. And maybe it wasn't shown as efficiently with the politicians, but I think there was still a great sense of that nationalism because they wanted a united Germany. So that, that's one example that I would think of, I guess. Um, kind of similar to what Billy asked, um, up until, let's see, you said, the Thirty Years' War, I'm wondering if you guys, like, just personally, if you genuinely think that nationalism was a force for change, or if it was a cause of change that was already going on. Yeah, um, before the Thirty Years' War, do you think that nationalism was actually like a cause for change, or just an effect of change that was going on? Like the change would have been coming from somewhere else, and nationalism was the result. I'd say it was an effect. Because I feel like if people are proud of what they got, they're going to want to defend that. And I mean, yeah, I, I just feel like if there's a change coming and you don't like it, you're going you're gonna to put your two cents in. So I feel like maybe you know, nationalism is that two cents that you're putting towards you know, that occurring factor that's going to affect you. Well, and you see in these situations where in certain nations, there's those outside forces and Maybe there wasn't so much nationalism there, but then they unite, the, the country unites in the form of nationalism. It's still like the sense of like our country against them. Right. Yeah. So I, I would lean more towards it being an effect. Other questions? Uh, I, I have one, I guess. Um, 
you talk about cultural nationalism and, and we start with language, right? But one of the things we've noted in Europe, as, as in what is now the United States, is the decline of different languages. That's one of the things that's been a consistent aspect over time, is that separate languages, in fact, have been disappearing in life. So the Southern French dialect is gone. Provençal is gone. It was prevalent at the beginning of the period. It's gone. <coughs> So how would you work that into the idea that language is a key cultural aspect of nationalism when, yes, Catalan's still here, but there are a lot of languages that have been hanging on by their fingertips, say Irish. Uh, uh, how, would you, how would you square that circle? I think I would say, like in, this, like in the case of Ireland um, and Great Britain, the dominating world powers feel that their culture is superior, as in the case of the Arabs, to colonialism. And so I think they have forced their culture on others. And because they're more powerful, they have the ability to do so. So it's an effort of imperialism, kind of I cultural would say imperialism? So. Okay. All right. Anything else? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>